So God has a word for us today, and I believe that it's going to help somebody. Um, I believe it's a word that's going to free somebody. If you believe that God is going to speak to you today, give God a real big hand clap of praise right now. And let's dive into God's word because we believe that there was power in the word of God. That there was life-altering, life-changing power in his word. And we want to be a part of what God is doing. And we want to take advantage of every bit of power that he gives us. How bad would it be if God offered us the ability to do great things in his name, to uh, be, a, would be his hands and feet on this earth, and yet we just neglect that power and look beside it and, and, and operate in something less than he has for us? How much of a disappointment would that be? Um, and so today we want to be able to move forward in the fullness of what God has reserved for each and every one of us. Um, let's turn in our Bibles. We're in 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Amen. And again, I believe if you are with me today and you really seek what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to you, that you'll get freed from some things, that you'll get empowered to go into some things, and you'll be confident and everything that God has reserved for you. Second Kings chapter four, verses one verse through seven. If you can do me a favor, stand on your feet as we honor the reading of God's word. Second Kings chapter four, verses one through seven. And if you have it, can you say amen? Amen. amen. If you need a second, say, wait a minute. All right, I'll wait for you. Get there. Second Kings chapter four, verses one through seven. Amen. And this is how it reads. This is now the wife of one of the sons of the prophet cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. And she said, your servant has nothing in the house. She says she's got nothing in the house. Except, okay, that negates what she just said, but except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. Verse 5 says, so she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Today, I want to talk to you briefly from the subject title, Use What You Got. Look at somebody and say, use what you got. Say it with your chest. Say, use what you got. Amen. Let's pray over the word. Lord, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would help us to use what you've given us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Use what you got. I know that's not quite proper English, but I wanted to add some emphasis on the word of God today so that you understand that you have enough to accomplish what God has set out for you to do. Back when I was in college and I was getting ready to graduate, one of the most difficult courses that I've ever taken in my entire life and I'm talking in my undergraduate program, one of the most difficult courses I had was my capstone class for my logistics and supply chain management. And it was, in looking back, something that was incredible that I even made it through that class because that work was hard. Now, I've had many classes over my time in school and I've had many different teachers and many different styles of teaching, but this class was unique because in this class, the teacher did not lecture. The teacher did not have you buy a book. The teacher made you use 
everything that you had learned previously in the program and take that information and take tests based off the things that you had learned before. In every other class, he accumulated it all, and we had to take tests not based off of a book that he made us read, not based off of lectures that he gave us, but based off of what we had already learned. And when I tell you, I thought, this is the end. I made it this far in college, and I'm not going to graduate because I got this hard class. But in the end, I decided the only way that I would graduate is if I listened to his instructions, I looked over all the things that I already had, took all my notes and accumulated them together, studied hard, and prepared to take the test that he gave to me. And even though I wasn't very confident in it all, I followed his instructions and I used what I had to take the coursework that he had given to us. And believe it or not, by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, I was able to take what I had and pass that class. We had a final exam that required you make a 75 on it. And believe it or not, I didn't make 75 on it. But because I listened to his instruction and I gathered all of the information that he gave me, I followed him step by step. He saw my effort and he curved my grade. And lo and behold, because I listened, because I followed the steps that he gave me, because I used everything that I had, I'm standing before you today, a college graduate. Amen, amen, amen. Believe me, that's a miracle, y'all. It is a miracle. <laughs> But I thank God for that because it really showed me that even in the most difficult of circumstances, even when things get hard, based on your time you spend developing your spirit, developing your time spent with God, developing yourself as a believer, developing yourself in faith, when it's time for that faith to be displayed, you'll have accumulated enough to go forth and have the power to accomplish what God has given you to do. Sometimes we get thrown into situations, and when we're thrown into those situations, we don't feel like we have the resources we need to survive. We feel like we don't have enough. We feel like we're short, and we won't be able to accomplish the goal that's set in front of us. But I promise you today, if you would just follow the lead of your instructor, if you would just take the resources that he's given you, if you'll just take time and really look at all the things that God has provided you in your life, in the time that he's taken to show his faithfulness in every circumstance, you'll realize that you have enough. You'll realize that you're built up to last. You'll know that no matter what the enemy throws at you, that you have acquired enough because of what Jesus Christ has done for you to defeat him in every way that he tries to come against you. In our scripture today, what we see is this woman who is a widow, and this widow is in need. Her husband, who was a prophet, said she told the man of God that he had died. And he didn't just die and leave her well off and, you know, leave her and her sons in a good position. He died and he left them debt. It's not that he didn't leave them an inheritance. He did the exact opposite and left them debt. And that, that's a lesson for us leaders of the household to make sure that we're leaving behind a good inheritance so the people behind us aren't left with our junk. But the man, he, he, he passed away and, and in this time, the debt that he had was transferred to the wife. And unfortunately, the wife did not have the means to pay off that debt. And so the debt collectors, not only were they coming for her, but they had permission to take her sons as collateral for the debt that she couldn't pay. So she found herself in a terrible predicament where she didn't have the money to pay. And not only that, but she was going to lose something even greater to her because of the situation that she didn't even put herself in. Notice it was her husband that had accumulated this debt and it fell into her lap to be responsible for paying it. And how many times do we find ourselves in our own life having to deal with debt that we didn't even accumulate? Dealing with circumstances that we didn't put ourselves into, but it was transferred to us. It's sad being on the hook for something we didn't even do. It, it, it can be rough in our life when we find ourselves dealing with the consequences of things that aren't even our fault. Dealing with the consequences based on what somebody else put us into. Let's be honest, we didn't have to be born into a dysfunctional family. Nobody asked that, that God would place them in a terrible relationship. To be put into these circumstances, but at times we find ourselves dealing with the debt of another person. This woman found herself desperate 
knowing that she had no choice but to try to take care of something of a mess that she did not even create. And so Elijah gives her this strategy, a strategy from heaven to unlock a blessing that she would have never seen had she not ran into this man of God. Eliza gives her this strategy to, to unlock this blessing, and I'm sure on the surface it probably seemed absolutely crazy to her. I know she probably heard what he was saying and initially was just listening like, you want me to do what? You realize that all I have, I'm telling you what I have, is just a little bit of oil. That's the, the entirety of the value of possessions that I have is this little bit of oil. But because she was desperate, because she had a real need, because she knew she needed to see a move and a miracle of God, she was faithful in following the words of the man of God. She was faithful in saying, even though this sounds nuts, even though this does not seem like what I need at this moment in time, I realize that if a word is given to me from God, then I can carry out the task and it'll accomplish exactly what I needed to do to meet my needs. And some of us need to get to a place in our life where our desperation matches the miracle that we need to see take place. Some of us need some great things from God in our life. Some of us need God to do some grand things in our life, but our desperation isn't matching the level of the miracle that we need to see. Some of us need to dive deeper into our words and get desperate to hear from God. Some of us need to get in our prayer closet and get desperate before God on our face, praying to God so that he could, we could see the fulfillment of what he has planned for us in our life. Our level of desperation needs to match the level of the miracle that we want to see in our life. Today, I want to look at how when we follow God's instructions, he can cause miraculous provision to take place. He can do things that we could never imagine if we would place our faith in him and follow after his word, regardless of what's going on. And if we do that, I promise you today that he'll be a God that restores. He'll be a God that redeems and he'll be a God that provides for us in every circumstance that we find ourselves in. But it starts with us using what we got. Somebody say it again. Say, use what you got. If we're going to do that, the first thing that we need to do is take inventory of what God has given to us. Take inventory of what God has provided for you in your life. When the widow tells the prophet Elisha that the debtors are going to take her sons as slaves because she doesn't have any money, the question that he asks her is, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? He doesn't start by going to God in prayer and saying, God, please make the trees that she has around her house grow money so that she can get every dollar that she needs to pay off these debtors. He doesn't start by saying, you should take some inventory of your neighbor's money and then try to go borrow some money from your neighbors. No, he asked her, what do you have in your own house? Not outside these walls. What do you possess right here? He asked, what do you already have? And I fear that some of us as the believers are looking outside of our own house solutions that are available for us right within our own walls. We're looking around and complicating the matter because what we're looking for, God has already given us what we need. And we're looking around and we're trying to find something that God has given to us in a seed form. God has already given you what you need in order to provide the, 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 the miracle that can take place. See, God has already given you the influence that you need to get investors for that business you want to start. God has already given you the contacts that you need in order to reach those that are around you. God is already giving you a word so that you can apply it and be successful in these relationships around you. But are you looking on the outside or are you looking from within where God has given you his Holy Spirit? Are you overlooking what God has already placed in your life? Are you downplaying what God has already given to you and given you the grace to accomplish her answer that she says is nothing he asks her what do you have and she says I have nothing but then she thinks about it and then she's like well except I got a little jar it's a little jar of oil and I think there's some value I know there's some value in that jar of oil but initially her response was nothing 
And I wonder how many times we overlook the thing that is valuable within our own house, overlook the thing that's valued within our own character, overlook that thing that could actually do something great and just say, I don't have enough. It's not enough. I don't have enough influence. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough patience. I don't have enough in order to accomplish what I need to see get done. And we overlook the small thing because we feel like it's not enough to accomplish what God has for us to do. She overlooked it because the fact was the ore was in seed form. The ore was just in seed form because we know what a seed A seed has to start in a small position. It starts small, and if you eat that seed, it won't accomplish what it's set forth to do. But if you plant that seed and allow it to break forth and allow the crop to grow up from it, that singular seed becomes something greater than it was in this previous form. And it was a seed, so she overlooked it. She just saw a little bit and didn't realize what it was. But I can promise you the fruition of the seed developing into something greater will be the the vehicle that leads to the miracle that she would be able to see. But she had to understand that the seed was not the end form, that the seed was not the end of it, that the seed was just the beginning and the promise of something greater. When we see a seed, we understand that it's just the foundation of of a crop. It's just the foundation of something that will grow into something much greater. But if we see that seed and see the potential in that seed, we won't overlook it. Because if we see it in the smallest form, we'll be like, well, that's not going to feed anybody. That's not going to do good for anybody. If I eat that right now, I'll be hungry still. If I eat that right now, it's still not going to meet my needs. But if we see the potential in the seed, then we'll have the confidence and the faith to plant the seed, to water the seed, to put soil over the seed, to do what we need to because we believe something great is going to break forth from it. Some of us have some seeds in our life that we may have been overlooking, that we may have not really been paying attention to because of how small it is, because it's not much to it. But if we had faith in God realizing that there's potential in that seed, we'd begin to water our gifts. We'd begin to uh, be people that took time to say, I'm going to cultivate this and I'm going to be that person that tends to this and pay attention to it because I know there's potential and it can grow into something greater than I ever imagined. And so she looked at it and she saw the seed. She thought about it. She said, I I got nothing except I do have this small jar of oil. I do have this small jar of oil. And I'm glad that she saw that oil. She saw it was small, but she recognized there was some value in it. And the Bible tells us, even though it looks small, that we shouldn't despise it. It says, despise not the day of small beginnings. Even though I don't know exactly where it goes, I see the potential in it. And something that's small can grow into something that's great if it's nourished properly. God has a habit of doing big things with what we view as small. God takes what we see as insignificant at times and does great things with it. Come here, Gideon. He took Gideon with 300 men. It was able to defeat 130,000 men because he does great things in small packages. He takes what we see as small and does great things because he allows us to see that it's only through his power and his might that victory is given. That mankind is only a conduit for his power to come to pass. And he can do great things even with things that we see as insignificant. He takes somebody like a shepherd boy who was out there with them sheep singing songs and playing the harp and not looking tough at all. And he takes him out to the battlefield on a whim to defeat a giant who everybody else in the army feared, even the king. Because he takes things that we see as small and insignificant and uses to do great things so that his power can be shown on display. He's a God that takes the small and does great things with it if you trust in him and take what you see as small and place it in his hands, place your faith in his hands and place your confidence in his ability You won't look at it as small anymore. You'll see the potential in every single thing. You'll see the potential in what others overlook. You'll see the potential on what at times you may not see in full size because you understand that God can do great things with things that are small. 
But it's important for us to take inventory of what we got. Don't just look at the great things in your life. Pay attention to what God has graced you to do. And look at those things and understand that he's able to do great miracles when you take inventory of those small things as well and you cultivate them in the right way. The second thing that we need to do is give God a vessel to use. Give God a vessel to use. Give him something to work with. Elijah tells the widow women that after he finds out about this oil, he tells her to go and borrow vessels from her neighbors. After her, he tells her that you need to, uh, after he finds out that she has that, he gives her instruction. And these instructions were, go get vessels from your neighbor and make sure they're empty. Give empty vessels. We're going to do something great here. I don't need you to go and get their vessels that are full of water. I don't need you to go and get their vessels that are full of dirt. I don't need you to have a vessel that already has something that's occupying the space. I need an empty vessel. I need something that's able to be used. I need something that allows for what's about to happen to flow in. And so he tells her, get empty vessels. And I, I could just imagine the faith that it required for her to go to her neighbors and ask to borrow their vessels. Because if she's is struggling as badly as she said she is, that she knows that everything's about to get taken for, from her, her neighbors probably are aware of that as well. They know that her husband died. They know that people are probably on her case trying to get the money that she owes to them. And yet she had to go ask them for empty vessels. They're like, empty vessels? I'm sure her neighbors were probably like, well, empty? You sure you don't need me to put a little something in there? Like, you just, you need an empty vessel? And she had to have the confidence to go and have the faith to get empty vessels from her neighbors that were around her. She had the confidence to trust in the word of the Lord given to her by the man of God. To trust that he's telling me the right thing to do by getting these empty vessels. That God wants me to come before him with vessels that were empty. She had to trust in the power of the Lord despite the embarrassment that she might feel. She had to trust in the power of the Lord and make room to receive something even if nobody else could see what she was actually going to get. She had to have faith to believe that this empty vessel can be used by God. I wonder how many empty vessels in this place today that have the faith to say God can fill me. God can use me. If I just make myself available, God can provide everything that needs to flow within me. Just bring yourself as an empty vessel. It may seem foolish to think that no matter what financial circumstance you find yourself in, that you can give unto the Lord. It, it may be silly for other people to see the things that you do, but at the same time, it's important that we make ourselves available for God to be used despite the optics from the outside. We need to be people that make room. Somebody say make room. We need to make room. If you want to start a business you may not have all the finances you need to start that business but if you believe that God is able and God has given you this vision and he's placed it upon your heart to start this business go start you a business account get you a, even if you only can put a dollar in that business account make room for God to do what he's going to do if, if you don't make room for it how do you ever expect it to happen make room for God to do something it may seem foolish to those that are looking on the outside, but you have to take the first step of faith in order to see the process come to pass. James 2 and 17 says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. So if you got faith that God is going to do it, but you don't show it, your faith is simply a wish. If, if you don't make space for God to operate, then what you're doing is making a wish, not operating in faith. You Believe that God is going to do it so you move forward in attitude that it's going to come to pass. Up on this stage right now, we got a, a set of drums. We don't have a drum player right now. But we're making room for God to expand what he's doing right here. Why would we believe that a drum player is going to come in and then we not have no drums? We have faith that God is going to do 
and expand for us. But at the same time, if we don't show that faith, we're just making a wish. And so it required in this narrative for this woman to show her faith by going collecting vessels and making room for the miracle to take place. She had to make room so that the miracle could come to pass. And if she did not have the room for it, then she would have never saw the flow that would take place from the oil. We have to give God a vessel to use. The Bible tells us that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro looking for someone he can use. He's looking for somebody who he can bestow something that they can steward. He's looking for somebody he, he can use to be his hands and feet in this world. But you have to be available to be used. You have to be available to partner with God. If you're walking around with your ears stopped up and plugged up and you don't want to hear God's word and you don't want to hear nothing from him or any direction he has for you, how could you ever expect to be used? It's important that we make ourselves available. God is looking to do a miracle and you just might be the person that it flows through. You just might be the person that God uses in order to accomplish what he has set to do on this earth. But we have to be those people that give God a vessel to use. The third thing that we need to do, and I, I know this is going to rattle some people and this may shake you up a little bit, might make you a little nervous when you have to do it, but you have to shut the door behind you. You got to shut the door behind you. Everybody and everyone will not be a part of what God has for you to accomplish in your life. Not everyone is meant to see the vision that God has for you individually. The vision for us as a church, that should be written down and made plain. But I promise you in your individual life, there are some people who will not be on board with what God has given you. And if you reveal it to them too early, they're going to come against you. Look at Joseph. What happened to Joseph? He got the vision early in life and he gave it too soon and his brothers tried to kill him. He did it too soon. So we have to be careful who we let in on the things that God is doing in our life because not everybody's going to be on your side. Some people will not like what God is getting ready to do for you. Some people will not be in line with God's purposes for you and your life. So we got to shut the door behind us. Elijah told the widow after she collected the vessels to shut the door behind her, to shut the door behind her. And here's what's amazing about God. He's one that he encourages community. He says, don't forsake the neglecting of the saints. Like we come together. He, he had the children of Israel come out and have community. He gave them laws and showed them how to live in accordance with uh, his standard. And he gave them things that would help them to live good together. And this holy community. So he he included community within this narrative. He said, go go to your neighbors and go get vessels. So they were a part of it. She didn't do it by herself. She still included them. But when it was time for something incredible to happen, he said, close the door behind you. The community is included, but he didn't need the neighbors in there making her lose her faith. He didn't need the neighbors in there pointing out how silly the fact is she got this big vessel and she finna pour this little bitty oil into. He didn't need the neighbors in there making fun of her and making her feel like what she was about to do was not going to come to pass. He says, use your community. Use people that can assist you and give you uh, vessels to, to make the miracle come to pass. But when it comes down to it, you don't need nobody in the room who ain't got the same faith that you got. You don't need nobody in there that'll try to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. You don't need anybody to surround you that'll make you think opposite of the word of God. You need people that are strong in faith to push you along. And so while the community is helping, at the end of the day, everybody didn't need to be in the room. Everybody didn't need to be in there. She needed her sons in there, and she needed just what God had called her to have in the room. We don't always need a crowd around while God is working. Because criticism will try to damage our faith. We don't always need a grip, big group of people around to try to push us along and try to help us accomplish things because I'll be honest with y'all, people are fickle. <laughs> people are fickle. They'll love you one day and they won't stand the sight of you the next day. People will be your friend on Monday and block your number by Wednesday. Like people are fickle. 
And so it's important sometimes she stood with the people that lived in her household, the people that were close to her, her, her sons, and they were in the room. But she shut the door to anything else. She shut the door to criticism. She shut the door to unbelief. She shut the door to anything that was contrary to the word of God. And I'm encouraging each and every one of you today to shut the door to anything that does not align with your purpose. Shut the door to anything that does not sound like God's word. Shut the door to those people that would try to criticize you for following God's word. When you shut the door, you'll be able to operate in peace and see God's miracles come to pass. Yell at me, shut the door. Shut the door. I'm sure she had love and appreciation for her neighbors. She, she was thankful that they let her borrow their vessels and she appreciated their help. But for what she had to do right there, she needed to shut the door. God is getting ready to work. And it's going to require us shutting the door. Get in the prayer closet sometimes and shutting that door. Getting before God. And shutting that door, seeking his face and shutting that door so he can have an opportunity to work with what we've given him. Shut the door. The final thing that I want you to understand as we are people that are getting ready to use what we got is that we have to pour in all that we have. Pour in all that you have. Give it your all. Don't just do it haphazardly. Don't just give it your sum. Give it your all. That means you give effort to the work that God has called you to do. Because it's important that we don't give our all to something that doesn't align with God's will. That we don't give our all to something that doesn't equate to the value that our life possesses. That we don't give our all to something just for the sake of giving our all, but we give our all in doing what God has called us to do. Give our all according to the word that's been established for our life that aligns with our purposes individually. Even after all the faith that she has shown by collecting these vessels, she still had to show more faith because once she collected these vessels, she had to take this little jar of oil and pour it into these big vessels. She still had to operate in faith. But fortunately for her, the doors was closed. She didn't have to worry about criticism from the outside. She might have even thought she looked silly in her own mind in front of her sons. But at the end of the day, she says, I'm going to pour everything that I have. It may just be in the end a little bit of oil in this vessel, but I'm obedient. So I'm going to pour everything that I have. She didn't say, I'm going to preserve some of this oil and maybe I can use it to cook a meal later and help us when they take everything else from us. She said she poured all that she had. I know some of us have a scarcity mindset and we feel like if we pour everything we have, then I won't have any to, to, to go around. I won't be sustained. If I give all that I have, then I'll be empty myself. But in this circumstance, when God had given the man of God the words to, to give her and the instruction for her things to do, she had to pour it all. And the beautiful things started happening when she began to pour. As she began to pour, not only was the jar not getting empty, but the vessels were getting full. Can you imagine how this looked? She was taking this little bitty jar that she had and poured it into this vessel. And instead of this getting empty, it was continuing to be filled miraculously. And the vessel below it was filled to the point where she had to bring another vessel in. And she had to tell her sons to bring another vessel in. And she was pouring, yet the jar continued to be restored. What's happening here? As we give our all, as we begin to pour into something, as we pour into what God has called us to do, he replenishes us. He revitalizes us. He rejuvenates us. And even though we're giving our all, somehow more is coming out of nowhere. I was giving all my time, I thought, and suddenly I had time to spare. I was giving all my effort, and suddenly I felt rest and peace no matter what was taking place. When we begin to give our all, doing according to what God has called us to do, he'll give us more than enough she poured and it was not empty 
it was not empty. They just kept filling up these vessels. And as they kept getting more and more vessels, the oil just kept pouring. Until finally, she says, bring me another. I said, her son was like, mama, you didn't use them all. All the vessels that we have collected, you filled each and every one of them. And then it was at that point that the oil stopped flowing. They had everything they needed. They had more than enough. And then at that point, the oil finally stopped. Some of us may be missing out on an abundant blessing by holding on to the little bit that we got. By holding on to that minuscule piece of something that you got. My father always used to say, if it doesn't meet the need, then maybe it's a seed. Maybe it's something that's preparing for a greater harvest if you would use it in the correct manner. It may not seem like enough, but when given in faith, it can yield giant results. It makes sense to me why Jesus saw the woman who only had a mite to give, a small amount of money to give. And he saw her do that and it said he marveled at it. He was amazed by her small gift. Why is that? Because she gave all that she had. And Jesus was amazed by seeing somebody with the faith to say my little bit may not be enough for me. But at the end of the day, when I place it in your hands, you're able to bless it and multiply it. You're able to make it do more than I ever could have conceived or imagined in my own mind. You're able to make it do exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or imagine because of that power that's working in me. You're able to make it do things that it could not have done in my hands. And so while it seems small, my small with faith the size of a mustard seed is able to accomplish great things, even move mountains, make the sea be removed. God is able to do great even when we see small. And so we see this incredible thing taking place, this miracle that we never could have imagined. We have to start praying with big faith if we expect to see big blessings. Even though we don't expect always to have everything that we need with the little bit that we got we can pray with big faith with the little bit that we have we're able to see God and expect miracles to take place we make room for this miracle to take place even with the small thing that we hold in our hand in a later narrative Elijah tells the king of Israel to take arrows and bang them on the ground. And the king of Israel takes the arrows, and he, one, two, three. All right, what am I doing? Why you got me banging the ground, Elijah? Like, what, what, what's going on here? This is silly. He bangs the ground three times, and Elijah gets upset at him. He said, why you only hit the ground three times? If you had have continued hitting the ground, you would see the enemy being under your feet for long periods of time. But because you only hit the ground a few times, you're only going to have peace from the enemy for just a little bit of time. Why? He didn't give his full effort. He saw something that he might have viewed as silly. He saw something that he might have viewed as insignificant, and he did not give his all. And because he did not give his all, he missed out on times of conquering in peace. I would hate in our lives today that we see something as small, insignificant, not worth the time. We don't give our effort to it and miss out on the great thing that we'd be on the other side of that had we fully committed to doing it, to doing the work, to giving everything that we have to see God's will come to pass in our circumstances. We have to keep striking the ground. We have to keep pouring in. We have to be those people that say, I'm giving my all and my full commitment. Once the woman completely fills the vessel, she goes back to Elijah and she said, I completed the task. And I I can see in my mind's eyes a big smile on her face. She probably skipped into him and was excited to tell him that the task has been completed. 
And she goes in there, and at the time, he gives her the solution to her debt problem. He gives her the solution. He gave her the instructions on what to do, and then he gives her the solution. He says, take those vessels of oil and go sell them, and then not only will you pay off your debt, but then you'll have enough to live on. The solution laid out for her, still requiring her to do work. It still wasn't just this oil. Now, all of a sudden, uh, the oil turns into money inside of the barrels. No, there was still work to do. And as believers in Christ, God can do miracles for us in our life. But there is still work for us to do. God can miraculously heal my body. But if I don't start eating right, it won't do me any good. God can do great things for restoring my relationship, but if I don't put in the work to actually get to know my partner and meet their needs, it won't do me no good. He's given us everything we needed. To, we saw a miracle take place, but you have to walk in the fullness of what God has given you to see the fruition of what he's blessed you with. We got to be people that don't stop short. Just because we saw God do a mighty wave and see a miracle take place doesn't mean we stop at that point. We keep going through and hearing more from God and seeing what he has for us to do next so that we can see the fullness of what he has for us. God is so good that he would give us a way out of hardships and not only just give us a way out and pay the debt that we couldn't pay because when it comes to Christ. We could not pay the debt of our sins, yet he gave us a, a sacrifice through his son Jesus to pay that debt for us that we couldn't pay. But the Bible tells us Jesus didn't come to just give us life, but life more abundantly. So not only did he pay the debt for us, but he's given us an abundance in our life for us to live good because of who our father is. He didn't just give enough for the widow woman to pay her debt, but he gave her more so that she could live off of it. And if we look at our lives the same way, we should be appreciative of the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. He gave us more than enough. And so today we make it our pledge to listen to the instructions that God has given us. And not only will he give us provision, not only can he give us healing, not only can he give us breakthrough, not only can he take this struggle away that we've been dealing with, not only can he bring us through the valley and give us what we need, he's able to give us an abundance within our lives. And so if you're struggling in a certain circumstance of not having enough, if you're struggling in a circumstance today to not have enough, understand the fact that that God is able not only to meet your need, but give you an abundance. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I thank you today that no matter what we're experiencing, you have enough. You are Jehovah Jireh. Father, you are enough. And we pray today, Lord God, that you would help us to remember that no matter what we're looking at, no matter what we see as small and insignificant in our life, you have enough. You are powerful and strong enough that if we place our faith in you, you would give us the miracle that we need to accomplish what's set, setting us back in life. Father, I ask you now that you would strengthen your children, Lord, that you would give us the confidence to believe in you, give us the strength to move forward in whatever we're dealing with in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we thank God today for having this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord, to hear a word from him and hopefully be strengthened. If you're watching this online or maybe there's someone in this place today that have never made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, today would be a great day to experience the peace, the love and the joy, the hope that comes from being a child of God. So today, before we leave this place, will there be anyone that's in this place that desires to make Jesus the Lord of their life, who've never made the decision to make Jesus their Lord and Savior? Will there be one today? Thank you, God. And if you may be watching this online and you want to make that decision, we're going to say this prayer together. And I believe that God is powerful enough to hear you where you are. 
and he's able to give you the change in your life that you desire. So if you want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, we're going to pray this short prayer together. And it's not in the words of the prayer, it's in the sincerity of your heart. So as you pray this, if you believe it, then I guarantee you, your eternity will be secured. So let's just pray this prayer together. Bow your heads if you would, and just repeat this prayer with those that are getting ready to change their lives. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I know I was born into sin, and I needed a Savior. And because you died on the cross and rose from the grave, I'm now free from sin. From this day forth, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's thank God today for those that just made a radical decision, life-changing, life-altering decision. Thank God for you today. And for those that maybe have joined us online today, we thank God for you joining this broadcast. We're just glad that you were able to fellowship with us today. We want to offer you an opportunity to come and worship with us in person. We're at 3710 Wellington Street right here in Greenville, Texas. If you're in the Hunt County area, come on out. Get your face in the place. We want to give you a handshake, high five, hug you around the neck. Just show you God's love. Um, Also, if you've been blessed by this broadcast and you want to take this opportunity to partner with us in giving, uh, what you'll see come on the screen is our cash app. That's dollar sign Rivers of Love Church, where we want to partner with you and um, help Uh, meet the needs in this community and you can be a part of that so um, you can give at that cash app also if you're interested in becoming part of the flow fam you've been blessed by what we're doing here and you want to be a part of the things taking place at rivers of love uh, you can text rol to the number you see on your screen Um, when you text that number you'll get um, updates on all the things taking place here at rivers of love Uh, We just thank God for having you here today. We want to let you know that God loves you, and so do we. Have a blessed week.